The news was rushed about. The volunteers had taken the GPO. They were in possession of several other places in the city. It was easy enough to get down O'Connell Street still, and I made my way to the GPO and asked the volunteer on guard to let me in to speak to Padraig Pierce, who was the only one of the leaders that I knew personally. I was brought to Pierce and had the temerity to tell him that I thought the rebellion was very wrong as it would certainly fail, but that I wished to be there if there was going to be anything doing. The first shot was fired at Dublin Castle. Helena Maloney was there with a party of nine girls from the Irish Citizen Army. Under the command of John Connolly, they took over the city hall. Later, they would be joined by the chief medical officer with the Irish Citizen Army, Dr. Kathleen Lynn. At about one o'clock, we were on the roof. Several men and I and some girls and uh, John Connolly. And he was struck. There was firing, you see, from the castle and from the roof of the houses opposite. And by that time, Dr. Lynn had arrived downstairs. And she came up and she said, I'm afraid he's going. So he lasted a couple of minutes. I said a prayer into his ear as he went and he was, he was dead. When carrying dispatches to the GPO, I saw the charge of the 5th Lancers down O'Connell Street and their repulse by fire from the GPO garrison. I also saw the hoisting of the tricolour in the GPO. On my return from the GPO, I saw Madame Markovic and William Partridge turn back a column of British soldiers who were advancing down Hartford Street. Madame had shot the two officers at the head of the column. Monday night we spent in Stevens Green. On Tuesday morning, we realized that our position was untenable, as British troops had succeeded in gaining possession of the Shelburne Hotel and were firing on us from the roof. Before we left the green, we lost one of our men, James Fox, who a few moments before had been singing, wrap the green flag around me, boys. We then evacuated the Green and took possession of the College of Surgeons. Margaret Skinner, a 23-year-old school teacher from Glasgow, was part of the 138-strong Stevens Green Battalion. A friend, Countess Markovich, was second in command under Michael Mallon. Over 200 women took part in the Rising, stationed at all major outposts in the city, except Boland's Mill. Well, now, as everybody knows by this time, in Boland's Mills, there were no common among, although they had waited on Mount Street Bridge to be called, and de Valera didn't approve of having girls from, I think he didn't want to put them in danger, and so there were no girls there, no women of any kind. Towards nightfall, they, they attacked the, the windows at the back of the city hall, which led out of the castle yard. There was an attack on that, and they evidently got in through one of the lower windows, because we heard a call, surrender. And that was repeated, because the plaster was falling in showers from the roof as a result of the firing on the city hall, you see. And um, we were taken out one by one through the window at the back and taken prisoner. Fire raged through the city, and by Friday the GPO was in flames. Pierce called on the 40 women stationed there and asked them to leave. By about Thursday, the front of the GPO had been set on fire. On Friday evening, a party of about 12 of us, five or six girls, a handful of wounded men, of whom only one was unable to walk, were told to get out of the back of the GPO and make our way to Jervis Street Hospital. It must have been just about that time that the garrison, led by Pierce and the others, got out into Henry Street and over to Moore Street. Three women chose to remain with the leaders of the Rising, Julia Grennan, Elizabeth O'Farrell and Winnie Carney. With the wounded James Connolly on a stretcher, they made their way through the blaze to a little house on Moore Street. 230 innocent civilians, including 28 children, had been killed in the fighting. On Friday night, Sean McDermott asked Elizabeth O'Farrell to make a white flag. 
Later, it was decided that she would deliver the surrender note. I left the house with a verbal message from Commandant Pierce to the commander of the British forces to the effect that he wished to treat with them. I waved the small white flag which I carried and the